Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here at our third edition of Human Rights at Debate Scholars at Risk Speaker Series. This event is a collaboration of some of our human rights key players at Pontifical Catholic University of Paraná, such as Law and Human Rights Graduate Programs, the Law School, the Human Rights Clinic, the School of Education and Humanities, Human Rights Hub, and of course, the Scholars at Risk Network. I would like to thank you all for making this possible. We're especially concerned about the actual re-emergence of conservative and authoritarian movements all over the world and also specifically in our country. Reflect upon different configurations of the authoritarianism and attempts on human rights, democracy, liberty, and free speech as brought by our invitees is a unique experience and we believe it could contribute to shed light and somehow influence our future. It is an honor to have here with us Dr. Semahain Gashu Abebe. Dr. Semahain received LLB degree from Addis Ababa University, LLM degree from University of Amsterdam and studied master's and doctorate degree at the University of Göttingen. Dr. Abebe worked as a public prosecutor and lecturer in Ethiopia and is the author of The Last Post Cold War Socialist Federation, Ethnicity, Ideology and Democracy in Ethiopia by Routledge. And he also published in among others, McGill Journal of International Sustainable Development and Law, St. Louis University Journal of Law, Journal of African Studies and Development, and Göttingen Journal of International Law. His research focuses on human rights, transitional and traditional justice, constitutional, developmental, and cultural issues pertinent to sub-Saharan Africa. He has extensive teaching and research experience. In 2013 up to 2014, he was O'Brien Fellow at Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism, McGill University. And in 2012 up to 2013, he was a Bank of Ireland Postdoctoral Fellow at the Irish Center for Human Rights. National University of Ireland, a visiting assistant professor at the Human Rights Institute of University of Connecticut. He is currently assistant professor of international studies at Endicott College. The title of today's speech is Conflict, Regional Stability and the Humanitarian Crisis in the Horn of Africa. One of the most unstable regions of the world, the Horn of Africa, is ravaged by border conflict, civil war, water disputes, and humanitarian crisis. Many of the countries in the Horn of Africa, including Sudan, South Sudan, Somalia, Eritrea, and Ethiopia, are affected by ethnic conflict, political repression, border and water disputes related to the Nile River. The presentation will highlight the major political and humanitarian crises in the Horn of Africa and the complex relations among the countries of the region. The presentation will address the peace building, regional collaboration and democratization endeavors aimed at alleviating the debilitating living conditions of the people in the region. Dr. Abebe my talk about 30 to 45 minutes long, and then we shall start a conversation on the issue and also collect questions made by the audience at our channels at YouTube. A link with inscriptions for the mission of a certificate will be presented futurely at the chat for the ones that will judge it necessarily. Today's discussants are myself, Kawe Krieger, anthropologist, professor and agent of internationalization of the School of Education and Humanities, and Sandra Gorski, PhD candidate at PUC-Pierre, 
Master in Human Rights at Paris University, Nanterre La Défense, and Master in Law at Poupier, and also Vivian Lemos, PhD student in Communication at Federal University of Paraná, Master in Human Rights and Public Policies by Poupier, and Professor at Unicuritiba, whom I thank especially for being here with us. Please let us welcome and listen to Dr. Abebe. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for a uh, generous introduction, uh, Professor uh, Kruger. Uh, this is uh, an honor for me to give uh, a presentation on uh, conflict and uh, humanitarian crisis in the Horn of Africa. Uh, I would like to extend also my uh, appreciation to scholars at risk, as well as the Catholic University, the professors, uh, the institutions which uh, are involved in organizing this event. Thank you. Uh, let, I, I will share a slide to uh, uh, give you a perspective and a context about uh, the conflict. As uh, Professor Kruger mentioned, uh, there are there are many uh, ethnic conflicts, border conflicts, water-related conflicts, political repre uh, repression, uh, dictatorship, uh, and also um, there is also proxy war among the major uh, global powers. So uh, my uh, presentation would try to uh, give you uh, the context in uh, those countries as well as uh, inter, uh, uh, inter country uh, conflicts in the region. Uh, when we see uh, the Horn of Africa, uh, as Professor Kruger mentioned, uh, this is one of the most unstable uh, region uh, in, the, uh, in Africa uh, because you find here uh, Sudan, uh, South Sudan, uh, you have Ethiopia. Somalia, uh, Djibouti, we have also here Kenya, but Kenya is really uh, the most stable country uh, in the region. But many of the countries in the region are affected by uh, different conflicts, war, uh, and also uh, poverty, and also uh, humanitarian crisis. Uh, that's why I think uh, even there is, um, significant um, attention uh, by the international community. I know if you have been following the news in the last few months, uh, for instance, uh, the conflict in Ethiopia has attracted uh, international attention because of uh, human rights violation as well as uh, humanitarian crisis uh, in the country. So, uh, First, I'll, I'll give you a uh, context in uh, each country in the region. Then uh, I would uh, present on some of the major uh, border as well as uh, water-related conflicts in, uh, in the Horn of Africa. Uh, one of uh, the most uh, really conflict-ridden country uh, in the region is South Sudan. It's just to the country of uh, 15 million people, uh, but uh, the country has many political, economic, and social problems. And uh, uh, probably the most important challenge is uh, ethnic uh, division. Uh, this is, uh, uh, South Sudan is uh, newly independent from uh, uh, Sudan, uh, it's just, it became independent uh, in 2011 because uh, after the British um, uh, left uh, Sudan uh, in 1956, there has been civil war between uh, South Sudan and uh, the, uh, the Sudanese government. Finally, there had been a peace agreement in 2005. Then there was um, a referendum uh, in 2011, the majority of the, the South Sudanese people decided to have their own state. So uh, 
it is a hard won uh, independence. But unfortunately, uh, independence uh, didn't bring about uh, stability uh, to, to the country. Uh, since 2013, uh, there is uh, ethnic conflict because there has been um, power uh, rivalry between the president and the vice president because uh, both individuals represent different ethnic groups. The president uh, represents uh, one of the major ethnic groups in South Sudan, which is the, uh, uh, the, the, the vice president also represents uh, nowhere uh, ethnic group, which is also a major one. So uh, the power struggle between these individuals led to inter-ethnic violence between the two uh, ethnic groups and uh, four million people are now, still now are internally displaced uh, in South Sudan. Uh, as you see here, uh, the picture here, millions of these people are uh, expecting uh, aid from the international community. Uh, and also uh, since there is a still uh, ongoing conflict in the country, uh, internally displaced people are uh, affected because uh, uh, militant groups storm these refugee camps and kill, kidnap, uh, rape uh, people. So this is a major uh, challenge uh, in the country. Uh, so these are the two individuals uh, the, on the left. This is a vice president, Rick Machar, and the president, Salva Kiir, uh, on the right. Uh, the international community has been trying to bring about peace uh, between these two uh, individuals. Uh, recently also there has been an agreement, but usually uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not really a, sustain, uh, a sustainable peace agreement because one of them would uh, break these agreements. So uh, still now there is no really a lasting solution for uh, the, the ethnic conflicts in the country. Uh, so uh, the South Sudan is really extremely affected by uh, ethnic based conflicts. Uh, not only... Yes. Let me just interrupt you one minute. Sorry for this. Would you mind uh, uh, clicking on the button for the presentation? I think it would be a little bit more, mm -hmm. more bigger and clear for everybody. And then you can use the arrows downstairs too. Okay. Is it clear now? Okay. Sorry. N not yet, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Do it again. Click it again, please. Mm, I did it. Please. Let us see. Yes. Um, no? Okay. Maybe if you could just. Uh, there's something it's it's not allowing. Strange. Maybe if you could just uh, increase the zoom, that would be uh, enough in the down yeah. right corner of your yeah. screen. Just... Yeah, that I think that's that's better already. Okay. Why it's not working here? Strange, but mm. anyway, thank you. Please, please move on. <laughs> okay, let me. It should work. Okay, what about now? Yes, yes, fantastic. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, for uh, the inconvenience. So, um, uh, for South Sudan, still now the international community is trying to bring about some kind of stability to bring about a uh, lasting peace agreement between these two groups. Uh, but uh, uh, there is no any uh, really uh, peace agreement which is now uh, addressing all those uh, conflicts in the country. Uh, so this will be one of the most important challenge for, for the international community uh, because 
it continues to be a serious challenge. Uh, the other country is uh, Sudan. Uh, so um, Sudan is uh, the geographically the largest country uh, uh, in the region. Uh, it has uh, really a, a very uh, significant uh, geographical size. And also, as I indicated earlier, uh, there has been civil war between uh, Sudan and South Sudan. Still, uh, there is a border dispute between uh, these two countries. It's not yet resolved. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Sudan is also uh, affected by uh, ethnic conflict as well as, well as uh, political repression. Uh, and uh, now there is um, a, a democratic transition. Uh, which is not yet clear how far this transition could achieve uh, a stable uh, democratic system in, in Sudan. Uh, particularly, uh, if you have been following, I think particularly in human rights, there has been a major conflict in the Darfur region of Sudan, which is in the uh, northwest part of uh, Sudan, uh, because uh, uh, the, the various indigenous ethnic groups in the region were uh, launching uh, insurrection against the, the Sudanese government. And the Sudanese government uh, equipped another uh, militia group, which is called the Janjaweed, pro-government fighters. And uh, the Sudanese government was uh, providing weapons for this uh, uh, militia group. Uh, and because of um, uh, such uh, devastating conflicts, uh, thousands of people were killed and hundreds of thousands of people displaced from their, their land. So still uh, the conflict continues. Of course, uh, there has been uh, an international effort to address this problem, particularly um, the International Criminal Court indicting the Sudanese president, al-Bashir, for committing genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Uh, when uh, President al-Bashir was in power, there was no any way uh, he, he would be brought to justice. But uh, since uh, he, was, he was removed from power in 2019, the new uh, leaders of Sudan have uh, promised that they will uh, uh, bring uh, al-Bashir to the International uh, Criminal Court. That's a big uh, change, but still uh, he's not facing justice at the International Criminal Court. So uh, one of the, the, the most difficult crises that Sudan should address is this Dar Darfur crisis. Uh, because still the, in, uh, the, the conflict between the various indigenous communities in the region is, uh, continues to be a serious uh, challenge for the stability of the country. Uh, this is uh, President uh, al-Bashir, who has been ruling Sudan for uh, 30 years. Uh, he was a military general. Uh, after he controlled political power, he was uh, eliminating his political opponents. Uh, freedom of expression was highly curtailed. Uh, and uh, there were many, many atrocities committed during his, his, his time. So now the, the Sudanese transitional government is trying to uh, bring him to justice as well for the uh, human rights violations in the country. So uh, really, it's not clear how uh, Sudan would also address uh, really these uh, 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 grave human rights violations during this uh, reign. So that will be also a serious challenge for Sudan. Uh, in 2018, there has been a significant uh, protest in the country because of economic uh, problems, particularly uh, increasing of the bread uh, price, fuel shortages, and current cri uh, currency crisis. Uh, even if the protest started uh, due to uh, uh, economic uh, uh, reasons, uh, it it 
it changed into a political uh, uh, kind of uh, protest. And the, the protesters demanded President Omar al-Bashir uh, leave power. Uh, finally, the military removed him from power because they, uh, the public protest against the, 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 the regime was very, very strong. So uh, after uh, President al-Bashir is uh, remo removed from power, there is a kind of power sharing agreement between uh, the military as well as the civilian political groups. So still there is tensions between the military, which is trying to consolidate its power, uh, as well as the civilian political groups, which are interested for a more uh, civilian rule in the country. Uh, so um, it's very uh, uncertain whether uh, really Sudan would have a successful uh, political transition into, into democracy. Uh, during the time of uh, al-Bashir, uh, the, the, the Sudanese had a very uh, really um, poor relationship with the international community, particularly with the United States. After this political transition, uh, Sudan restored its relations with the United States. It restored its uh, relations with Israel. It's, it's a major, a major change because Sudan is an um, uh, Arab country. Uh, so uh, now the United States is now more attracted to Sudan, providing more aid uh, and also uh, uh, more uh, uh, pre present but diplomatic uh, support for the new the new government. So this will be also one of the challenges in the region. The other is Eritrea, uh, which is which is called uh, the Red Sea State, or some call uh, Eritrea uh, the North Korea of Africa. Uh, Eritrea was uh, part of Ethiopia for a long time. Uh, but uh, there was um, armed struggle against the Ethiopian government for 30 years. Then in 1991, uh, Eritrea uh, became independent. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, as it happened in South Sudan, uh, this political independence didn't, didn't bring about significant the significant political change is the country. Still now there is uh, political uh, uh, repression. Uh, particularly there is uh, a compulsory military service in Eritrea. Uh, it's indefinite. So uh, tens of thousands of Eritrean uh, youth, they have left the country. They are refugees in Europe and uh, in uh, Middle East as well as, as in Africa. Uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, in 1998 to 2000, there was a, a really major uh, border conflict with Ethiopia. Tens of thousands of people were killed during this, this conflict. So uh, Eritrea is really a major challenge for the region as well because it has uh, many uh, conflict, border conflict with many of the countries. It has, it has, it, it had conflict with Sudan. It had some conflict with Djibouti, which is also a tiny country at the southern uh, part of uh, 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 Eritrea. So this is Isaiah Saforki, uh, who is uh, uh, president of Eritrea for the last 30 years. Uh, there is no any opposition party in Eritrea. It's not allowed. There is no constitution. There is no uh, free press. Uh, so he just uh, 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 rules the country with just uh, by his own just uh, uh, military power. Uh, so uh, I think uh, unless there is uh, some kind of political transition uh, in the country, such a severe political repression would lead to uh, violence and maybe also civil war. Uh, which might uh, destabilize the region. Uh, and also now uh, the Eritrean military is involved in the conflict in Ethiopia, which I will uh, uh, explain later. So this is one of the major challenge we have in the region. Uh, the other is Somalia. Uh, 
uh, sorry, it's splitting. Somalia is, uh, if you, you have been following the international news, as you know, uh, Somalia state collapsed uh, in 1991. After that, there has never been any strong central government. As you see here, for instance, Somaliland uh, is already uh, a breakaway region, which has already declared independence, even if it has not been uh, recognized by the international community, it, has, it is uh, a region which has its own institutions. And also there is Puntland, which is also uh, have its own autonomy. So uh, the proper Somalia, it, it has now marred by uh, inter-clan conflicts. Uh, in, in the Somali culture, there are many clans, which is ethnic groups, which are fighting for political power. So it has increasingly, it has become increasingly very difficult to have a strong and stable uh, uh, government in Somalia. So the, 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 the Somali government uh, is very weak. It's not in control of the country because uh, there are also Islamist groups which are operating in the region. Particularly there is Islamist group uh, which is called Al-Shabaab, uh, which tries to bring about uh, a kind of fundamental uh, Islamic views and also uh, killing civilians. Uh, that's why now uh, the African Union has uh, peacekeeping forces in Somalia, uh, backed by uh, the United Nations, uh, the United States and the European Union. So uh, really Somalia would continue to be a major challenge because it is a weak government, there is a division, there is also um, terrorist groups operating in the country. There are also uh, breakaway regions uh, which have already been separated from Somaliland. And uh, it's not clear how all these political divisions could be addressed in the, the country. So uh, Ethiopia, which is probably the most uh, uh, powerful country in the region with uh, 110 million people. Uh, Ethiopia is the second populous country in, in, in Africa. I think many people uh, uh, do not know about this. It's a big country. Uh, the current political system uh, was uh, established in 1991 when rebel groups controlled political power and removed uh, a very uh, a strong Marxist government. Uh, so the, the, the forces which um, ousted the military government is under the TPLF, uh, the Tigrayan People Liberation Front, which is now also uh, fighting the central government in Ethiopia. Uh, uh, after the transitional process, uh, of course, there, has, there was hope that uh, this transition would bring about some kind of uh, peace and stability uh, for Ethiopia. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, a new uh, uh, ruling class was uh, established. Uh, in addition to that, uh, this TPLF, APRDF government, uh, they were uh, limiting freedom of uh, speech, association, assembly, uh, as well as uh, any uh, democratic rights were, uh, uh, were restricted. So people were uh, uh, still, uh, of course, it continues, uh, tortured, uh, forced to exile, all the elections were rigged. So all these kind of political repressions uh, brought about uh, a significant uh, political instability to the country because there, there were always um, uh, conflicts, violence, protesters, uh, instability, particularly the Ethiopian, which is very different. I think Brazil has a federal government, but uh, in Ethiopia, our, our uh, federal arrangement is based on uh, ethnic identity. So the, uh, the regions are divided according to ethnic lines. As you see here, all these regions are uh, demarcated according to the linguistic differences we have. So I think this has brought about a really significant uh, a division and uh, polarization in Ethiopia. Uh, because you know uh, when you are uh, living in another state, uh, you have to speak the local language. You are considered to be alien uh, uh, when, when you are living in that part of the country. 
there is also uh, border conflicts between these groups uh, claiming land from one region to, to uh, from the other. So uh, the, the political structure itself has brought about significant political uh, a crisis. As uh, Professor uh, Kruger mentioned, I have uh, my book uh, focuses on the uh, structural problems of this, this kind of political structure. Uh, it's like uh, former Yugoslavia, where country uh, or the, the, the regions were demarcated according to ethnic lines, and uh, after uh, Marshal Tito died in Yugoslavia, uh, Yugoslavia dismantled. Uh, so my concern is that such kind of ethnic-based federal arrangement could bring about such kind of uh, disintegration in Ethiopia. So, uh, you know, Ethiopia is a very big country. If there is such uh, uh, disintegration and civil war, uh, it could affect the whole region. Not only that, uh, it will affect Europe because many of the people will try to cross into Europe. Even now, uh, millions of Ethiopians are trying to cross into other borders because of the economic, political, and other uh, problems uh, in the country. So this will be a, a major security challenge for, for the region. So uh, this is how the Ethiopian federal arrangement was uh, transformed, how it didn't bring about any kind of uh, really stability, democracy, or protection of human rights. So finally, uh, uh, there had been uh, protests in, 19, uh, in 2017, 2018, in many parts of the country. Uh, finally, this, uh, uh, the, the TPLF, EPRDF government could not maintain uh, national unity, stability of the country, and uh, forced uh, to undertake a reform. So a new prime minister, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, came to power in 2018. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, he won the, the Nobel Peace Prize uh, for his reforms because when he came to power, he, he, um, he released political prisoners or dissident political groups were allowed to operate in Ethiopia, uh, freedom of speech permitted. And also, uh, in, uh, really, he was uh, preaching national unity and reconciliation. Uh, which is uh, very, very important for Ethiopia because uh, the country is uh, significantly uh, polarized and divided according to ethnic lines. So he was really, of course, still now, he's very popular uh, in the country. But the problem is due to the complex political problems in the country, he didn't come up with a clear roadmap how to address the political differences in the country. So because of lack of clarity about his reforms, again, uh, the, the ethnic division conflicts continue to really uh, challenge his uh, reform agenda. Still now there are many conflicts uh, which we are going to see some of the major ones. Uh, on the international media, you will see that uh, many uh, inter-ethnic conflicts are going on uh, in the country. Uh, hundreds of people being killed just in, in just one part of the country uh, and also in, a, in other parts of the country. So this is now really major challenge for uh, any kind of uh, political stability of Ethiopia as well as to the Horn of Africa. Uh, particularly now, the most serious political uh, diff, uh, uh, really challenge and for the stability of Ethiopia is uh, the conflict in Tigray, uh, Tigray region of Ethiopia. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, TPLF, which is the Tigrayan People Liberation Front, uh, which controlled political power in 1991, originated from this part of the country, Tigray. It was uh, a political group established for uh, better autonomy for Tigray, but after it controlled political power in 1991, it was uh, uh, responsible for human rights violations, uh, ethnic division, uh, repression, and corruption. 
Finally, uh, when TPLF forced to leave the political power at the central government, they went back to the region and they tried to consolidate their power at the regional level uh, to challenge the new administration. So uh, tension started to build between the central government and TPLF, which, which was in control of the Tigray region. So that is uh, the, 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 the most important uh, uh, cause for the, the, the existing uh, political uh, problem in the country. Uh, particularly the immediate cause was on November 4, the TPLA force attacked the Ethiopian military base in, in Tigray. Uh, federal troops were kidnapped, killed, weapons were seized by the, the TPLF. Uh, finally, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed ordered military offensive against the TPLA forces in Tigray region. Uh, uh, of course, uh, the Ethiopian military forces controlled the capital, Mekale, uh, but still fighting continued. Uh, because now TPLF is waging uh, a sporadic armed struggle in the region. Uh, that has brought about significant instability uh, in, the, in the region. The other, which is very unique, is uh, Eritrea. Eritrea is also involved in the conflict because uh, there, there was a border conflict between Ethiopia and Eritrea. And during that time, uh, TPLF or the Tigrayan People Liberation Front was in control of political power in Ethiopia. And uh, the Eritrean government or Isaiah Safork is a president feels that the most uh, important uh, political group which was attacking Eritrea during the border war was the Tigray Liberation Front. So um, when uh, Abiy Ahmed came to power, uh, this is a border conflict between the two countries. When Abiy Ahmed came to power in 2018, uh, they tried to bring about reconciliation between the two countries. Particularly, Abiy Ahmed restored uh, diplomatic relations with Eritrea. Uh, flights between Asmara and Addis Ababa is restored. But uh, TPLF was not happy about it because uh, they think that um, this will not bring about uh, lasting peace and stability between uh, in the region. So uh, the Ethiopian government and the Eritrean government were working together to attack the TPLA force, which is it's not really common in many cases because uh, in many cases, foreign governments would work with rebel groups, but here, the two governments were working against the TPLF, which was a uh, really major political power in Ethiopia for the last 30 years. So uh, the international community is now demanding the withdrawal of Eritrean troops from, from Ethiopia, which is also very complex. So the problem now is uh, the last uh, few months now, there is major humanitarian crisis in, in, the, in the region. Millions of people are internally displaced. Uh, civilians are uh, targeted. Uh, many um, social and economic infrastructure destroyed, attacked during the war. And uh, the United States, the European Union, the United Nations are demanding that Eritrean troops immediately leave. Uh, uh, the region, as well as uh, they are calling for a ceasefire and also uh, accountability of the commission of uh, early human rights violations, rape, uh, uh, crimes against humanity, and also war crimes are being committed in the, in the region by all the uh, armed groups operating uh, in the region. Uh, the, the international community is mounting their uh, pressure on Eritrea and Ethiopian government, but still uh, there is no any solution because uh, the, the Ethiopian government has rejected any uh, ceasefire with uh, TPLF uh, because uh, 
the, the, even the people in many parts of the country also, they, they, they don't like TPLF and they don't want any peace process between TPLF and the central government. Uh, but the international community is trying to really uh, bring about uh, some, some kind of ceasefire uh, that would help uh, addressing the humanitarian crisis in the region, as well as uh, to stop uh, human rights violations in the region. So I think uh, this would be uh, probably the major challenge uh, Ethiopia, as well as the Horn of Africa facing now. Uh, it's not clear now how this could be addressed, it's not clear how the pressure from the international community could bring about um, any uh, any results because the Ethiopian government, the Trian government, they are not really uh, uh, taking the uh, the recommendations and pressures from the the, Euro the United States and also the, the European Union. So this would be a major challenge for 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 the region. The other so. Each of these countries have their own political crisis, ethnic uh, uh, conflicts. Uh, uh, in addition to that, all this poverty and all uh, challenges were. The other is border disputes. There is now a major border dispute between Sudan and Ethiopia, particularly this fertile region of what they call it Al Fashka region. Because, you know, uh, African border was just drawn by colonial powers. So still there are many disputes uh, in, in the region. So um, there were colonial treaties about these borders uh, because the British were uh, controlling Sudan, but Ethiopia was independent, but there was some kind of treaty between Ethiopia and the British government during colonial time, but there has never been any demarcation but um, uh, when the Ethiopian military was engaged in the war in Tigray, the Sudanese army took advantage of it and controlled much of the territory, uh, about like 50, uh, 50 kilometers into the Ethiopian border. Uh, so Ethiopia is uh, really accusing Sudan of being used by Egypt because of the uh, Nile uh, uh, dispute. Uh, still now, the Sudanese government is not willing to withdraw its military from the region uh, because they claim that it belongs to them. So I think uh, there, would not, there is no any kind of solution here uh, because the Ethiopian government, I think, would start to uh, maybe uh, defend its borders and this would lead to major uh, war between the two countries. Uh, probably the other major uh, tension in the region is water conflict. Uh, this is uh, the uh, a major um, hydroelectric power dam, uh, which is being under construction in, in, in Ethiopia. It's called the Grand Renaissance Ethiopian uh, Dam, which is uh, probably when it is finalized, it will be the biggest dam uh, in, in Africa, with generating electricity. But this, this has brought about also another tension in the region because uh, Egypt relies on the Nile for 85% of its water supply. And most of this water uh, originates from Ethiopia. And Ethiopia is a poor country with uh, 110 million people. Uh, so Ethiopia is trying to use its, its resources to improve the living conditions of its own people. Uh, but Egypt, they are very concerned that uh, this would uh, really affect their uh, water share, as well as uh, Ethiopia would have power to control uh, Africa's longest river, the Nile, uh, because this would uh, this will bring about also new uh, uh, geopolitical relations, because once Ethiopia has this dam, this would uh, really uh, give Ethiopia a big power over the region. So um, Egypt and Sudan, uh, they are uh, trying to pressure Ethiopia for some kind of agreement uh, that would uh, really limit uh, the, the power of Ethiopia over the Lyle River or 
to the uh, to the dam itself, and there has been really a number of negotiations uh, and uh, uh, meeting with uh, Ethiopia, Sudan, and e Egypt, but there has never been any agreement until now. Uh, uh, now in Ethiopia, it is a uh, 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 rainy season, and Ethiopia is preparing to fill the dam uh, uh, next two months, and. Uh, uh, before that, uh, Egypt and Sudan are trying to pressure Ethiopia to come to some kind of agreement with the two countries before undertaking uh, the uh, filling of, of the dam. Uh, this has also really uh, brought about significant tensions uh, in the region because Sudan and um, Egypt are threatening Ethiopia even to take uh, military action if uh, Ethiopia doesn't agree with their demands. So it, it will be a major uh, devastation uh, to the region. So um, these are really major uh, inter-ethnic uh, and also interstate, interstate conflicts we have, we have in the region. In addition to that, um, there is also Sudan-South Sudan border dispute. Uh, after South Sudan uh, has its own dependence. Uh, the, there is no any clear demarcation between the border between Sudan and South Sudan. Particularly the, the, the border region is uh, rich in oil, particularly this Abe region. So um, there has been a significant border dispute and now uh, there is uh, peacekeeping forces uh, operating in the, uh, in, the, in the region because of the border dispute. So it's not yet resolved. It's not yet clear how this would also be resolved in the future. So this would be also a, a major concern uh, in the future. The other is uh, many of the global powers uh, are now uh, trying to uh, control uh, the region because uh, the region is um, in the major trade route uh, from uh, Asia to uh, Europe. As you see, uh, this is uh, Babel Mandeb, which is connecting the Gulf of Aden with the Red Sea, as well as the, the Suez Canal here, which is a major um, uh, uh, channel connecting Mediterranean with the Red Sea. So uh, this is uh, geopolitically a very important region. So many of the countries, the, the powerful countries around the world, they have, are trying to have some kind of presence and influence in the region. For instance, as you see, the tiny country Djibouti, which is uh, which has only just one million people, <clears throat> there are now uh, about uh, five military bases from different countries: China, Japan, Italy, France. The United States and Saudi Arabia have military bases in the region because uh, they wanted to control the regions uh, because also uh, Somalia, uh, there is no really strong a strong state, there is no stability. And uh, in order to really secure safe uh, trade routes uh, in the region, all these um, countries have military uh, presence. So uh, this has also exacerbated really the tension in the region because these countries are trying to have their own influences in the region. In addition to that, uh, there are other countries which are involved, <clears throat> yeah, that like uh, Russia, for instance, they are also trying to uh, really uh, present itself as a non-colonial power because most of the other countries had some kind of colonial history in Africa, which is rejected by, uh, or at least uh, uh, many African leaders are not comfortable with the colonial history. So Russia is trying to present itself uh, as really a, a, a country which was helping these African countries against colonialism. Uh, even China, which is also uh, a very, uh, really, uh, it has a significant presence in the region. It provides economic uh, development as well as a new model of like state uh, developmental state model, which is now imitated by many African countries. Uh, the United States also is trying to really um, it has many interests. Mainly, it was uh, counter terrorism for a long time. Now, the United States is uh, really, uh, uh, really 
it has a trade like uh, uh, China might be controlling the whole region. Uh, the presence of Russia or Iran in the region could affect also the, the, the uh, really the United States interests in the region. So the United States also is trying to really uh, co control and influence in the region. So I think uh, one of the challenges also all these powers are trying to exert some kind of uh, influence in the region. This has also uh, has a destabilizing uh, factor in the region. So in general, um, this is a very complex uh, uh, political and uh, really geopolitical uh, uh, issues in the region. So unless really uh, uh, different uh, measures are taken to address the problems in the region, I think this could be uh, really the, the major disaster uh, would, would happen in the next few years. So I think one of the, really, what are the ways to, to address these problems? I think um, when you see the region uh, compared to even by African standard, the, there is a very poor democratization process in the region. There is no really a significant uh, democratization process in the region. I think uh, these uh, global powers which are fighting for influence in the region should work on uh, really to bring about some kind of accountable government, uh, transparent government, uh, and uh, to really uh, to have more uh, stable uh, institutions uh, in, in these countries because unless there is uh, a democratic system, there will be more conflict because these countries are ethnically divided and um, there are economic uh, problems, unemployment, poverty, uh, even now climate change is highly affecting uh, the region. So whenever there is lack of uh, opportunities, then it will, it, the people would resort to violence. So uh, there is other is achieving major economic development. The, the, the region has resources. Uh, if you take like South Sudan or Ethiopia or uh, uh, Sudan itself, they, they, they really have resources, but uh, there is no really uh, significant economic development because of the instability. Many of the foreign direct investments are not really uh, interested to invest in the in the region because of instability. Uh, so uh, and also lack of infrastructure uh, in the region is not attracting for investors. So I think one of the ways is also to bring about some uh, level of economic development. Otherwise, I think that will be very devastating. The other is um, ethnic divisions. Uh, countries, Sudan, uh, South Sudan and Ethiopia particularly, and also Somalia. The major challenge for uh, stability of these countries is um, ethnic division. So I think what's very important is to bring about a political system which accommodates uh, linguistic, ethnic, or cultural differences, as well as uh, maintaining national unity. I think uh, the, the, the challenge is uh, how to maintain the balance. Some of the countries like Ethiopia, they adopted a very divisive political system. Some other countries, they, they don't even recognize ethnic or uh, linguistic diversity. So I think that's also a major challenge. So the international community should help these countries to develop institutions and uh, systems that could bring about really some kind of uh, balance between these two competing interests. The other is also lack of regional cooperation and integration. When you see these countries, there is very minimal regional cooperation and integration. There, is, there are some institutions which are trying to bring about uh, regional integration and cooperation, but they are very weak, uh, as well as um, the, really the, the relationship between these countries is always very tense because of these border conflicts, because of resource conflicts. Uh, it has become very difficult uh, uh, really to, to, uh, to bring really some kind of regional integration and cooperation in addition to that. Many of these powerful countries are uh, engaged in uh, some kind of proxy war to, to promote their own geopolitical interests. All this has also undermined uh, a stable 
uh, regional cooperation and integration. So I think uh, all these reg uh, global political powers, uh, rather than trying to really promote their own uh, selfish interests, they should work together for uh, regional stability in, in, in the region. Otherwise, uh, the economic problems, the conflict is, uh, would lead to really major disaster in the region because many of the countries could uh, really uh, have uh, really genocide or uh, major uh, border conflict or war. So I think when you see the, 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 the problems, uh, uh, it's very complex, but uh, the, the, the solutions and the participation of the international community is very, very low uh, compared to the, the challenges the region uh, has been facing. Thank you for uh, your time. So when, if you have questions or comments, uh, uh, I, will, I will answer your questions. Thank you. Well, uh... Professor uh, Semahain Gashu, uh, what a fantastic presentation of a impressive, complex and sad uh, geopolitical situation. You, you, brought, you brought us from the past up to now and led us uh, a bit to the future. <laughs> so I think we are still processing a little bit of all this. Although we are lacking words, uh, I think uh, maybe we could uh, propose some questions here. And I'll be uh, looking for the chat uh, for maybe bringing some questions from our audience from to, to you directly to you. I would kindly uh, pass the word to, to Professor Sandro and after to Vivian to post a first round of questions. And I might add something, uh, but thank you very much for all your your exposition so far. Thank you. Uh, good evening to all. I'd like to thank you, Professor Samhaya Bibi, for sharing with us uh, the human rights issues of your region, the Horn of Africa. It is a very interesting topic, and I'm sure our colleagues and the audience are glad to have this opportunity. Well, my question is related uh, with this integration that you've mentioned in the end. And I wanted to know if there's a role that the African and the people human rights system could play in this, in this integration. If this human rights system could, could help reestablish the democrat democracy in those in those countries and if they actually if they achieve if they achieve this this objective um even uh taking into account into account the code the diversity culture that we have in the region and also the the different uh political views made from the ethnic groups. And also I have another question uh, um, to, I'd like to know if the corporations have been uh, uh, involved in these conflicts, in these human rights violations, if you were aware of this, uh, of these actions of business in the, in the region. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, it was very interesting uh, questions. Um, I think the, the as you mentioned, the human rights discourse uh, really could could have contributed a lot uh, to really address uh, the human rights violations in the Horn of Africa. Uh, I think there are many challenges for this. Uh, one is the uh, the weakness of the African Union institutions itself. When you see the African Union, it has its own uh, human rights institutions and other uh, relevant uh, groups working on human rights, but uh, when you see the, uh, you know, the, the, the African Union, uh, it it gives more of power to the General Assembly, which is uh, the meeting of the leaders, and uh, these leaders are not really interested to give much power to the institutions. For instance, there is the, the uh, African the, the African Human Rights Commission, which is trying to really. Uh, 
uh, bring awareness and address uh, human rights problems uh, in Africa, but uh, its uh, decision doesn't have any binding rule and uh, or valid. But uh, it's playing a role. For instance, there was um, land grab uh, in in uh, in Ethiopia before a few years. Uh, the Ethiopian government was displacing uh, indigenous people from the region so that it wants to give the land for uh, foreign investors. And uh, the, the African Human Rights Commission uh, published a report that this will be a violation of the rights of indigenous people. But the problem is uh, this is not binding, uh, even if it has its own influence. But in the last few years, I think because of the really the real tensions be between these countries as well as uh, ethnic conflicts, the, the African Union and institutions are literally silent about all these grave human rights violations because uh, the African government, for instance, if the African Union publish or uh, issue a strong statement about human rights violations in Ethiopia, the African Union head, head office is in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. Ethiopia is a founding member of the African Union and it, it, would, it would have a problem for the, the organization to work with Ethiopia. So usually the African institutions do not want to have some kind of problem with the government. So they are not really doing much. Rather, I think the United Nations Human Rights Commission is really uh, issuing different statements, reports about the human rights violations in different parts of, uh, of, of the country, but African institutions are not playing really a significant role to address the problem. There are some uh, regional integration efforts. There is an institution called IGAD, Intergovernmental Agency for uh, Development in the region. Uh, but these countries have competing interests, they have rivalries, and they are not really working together to address the problems. There is also another uh, regional uh, cooperation, which is called the African Initiative or Horn of Africa Initiative, which is mainly supported by the European, the European Union to bring about more economic development and stabilities to the region. But still, when you see the, the really the, the severe economic and political challenges uh, facing the region, uh, their um, uh, really role is very, very uh, li limited. Uh, when, uh, whether the, this is, uh, corporations are directly involved in the violation of human rights, uh, we, we can say, I think, for instance, during the, there was a land grab in 2012, 2011, after the 2008 uh, economic crisis, many companies were trying to control land uh, in the region, in South Sudan, uh, and uh, particularly also in Ethiopia, as well as in Sudan. And many of the, the companies from the Middle East, from India, China, they were involved directly uh, in the violations of human rights because uh, by corrupting local leaders, they tried to buy land and uh, this resulted in the displacement of indigenous people from their land. So there has been um, uh, involvement of uh, uh, corporations, particularly in the land grabs. Uh, in other cases now, um, Chinese companies have a significant, uh, a significant presence in the region, particularly in Ethiopia and uh, Sudan. Uh, many of these Chinese companies are accused of violating the rights of the workers because many of these companies, uh, Chinese companies, they don't allow workers to have their own union. They don't uh, really, the, 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 they don't give them fair payment. Uh, uh, the, the working conditions are not safe. So yeah, uh, many companies are also uh, implicated. But most of the, the Western companies are not really extensively working in this region because of lack of stability. Uh, they are not really working in the region. That's why you don't find really a significant presence of Western corporations in the, in the region. Thank you. Can I go? <laughs> yeah. 
Professor Samahai, first of all, thank you for your wonderful lecture. It was a real class. Thank you very much thank you. for sharing all your knowledge with us. Uh, as a journalist, I always wonder about the importance of free press and freedom of speech. Mm. And you talked briefly about the lack of free press in some of these countries in the Horn of Africa. So I want to ask you, uh, what do you think is the importance of a free press and freedom of speech in the building of democracy and stability? Mm. And the second, uh, the second question is, um, economy is, seems to be always an excuse for the rise of authoritarianism mm. and the conservatism. Do you agree? Do you think that even in a region as the Horn of Africa, which is also known for historical poverty and we, we all know about the economical mm. problems of the region, but do you think that even in a region uh, like the Horn of Africa, economy is uh, still today used it as an excuse for the, the rise of conservatism? Very good, very good. Thank you, uh, really very, very interesting uh, questions. Um, uh, I think in terms of uh, free media, as you mentioned, in any democracy, uh, Free press and freedom of expression is one of the really the building blocks for for democracy. And uh, by, uh, if I share my experience, uh, there was an election in 2005 in Ethiopia, and uh, I was highly engaged in that election. It was a very competitive election, uh, but finally the government or the ruling party was not willing to uh, leave power, even if I think we believe that it has lost. Um, the, 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 the mandate. After that, uh, they completely blocked all the free media in the country. And also I was a professor there in Ethiopia and also they uh, tried to restrict academic freedom. That's why I, I left the country. I, I, was, I was forced to leave the country because there is no any political space, uh, freedom of uh, expression or academic uh, freedom was highly restricted. Uh, yeah, I think one of the, the problems in the region, in many, in, I think I don't, I don't uh, see really uh, a country in the region where there is uh, really a uh, significant uh, progress in terms of uh, uh, giving more rights and freedoms. I, as I mentioned, Kenya is, uh, is, a, is a very uh, democratic country. There is free press, free TV, or and also media. So Kenya is really doing well, but in Eritrea, even there is no any pre, any free press is allowed uh, in Sudan. After the the, the, the change in 19, 2019, there are now some uh, free press, uh, uh, but still uh, the military government is uh, highly controlling it. In Ethiopia, of course, after 2018, there has been a significant progress, uh, but still now uh, there is an election this this month, and uh, there is now and more pressure to restrict freedom of expression. Uh, South Sudan, I think even it's a very new country. It doesn't have any institutions, Djibouti, Somalia, all these countries, there is no really freedom of expression. As you mentioned, it's very important. Uh, how we brought about uh, political changes, uh, what we did was when there was really no way you can uh, uh, really bring about uh, ideas, information to the people, we establish uh, satellite TV broadcasting from the United States. And also we have been using social media to bring about changes. And I think we achieved it and we have brought about really some, some kind of reform 2018. But now I think I am also concerned about uh, freedom of expression because uh, freedom of uh, expression in a, a, a very polarized political situation could be also very dangerous. For instance, now in Ethiopia, uh, all, all the political differences are based on ethnic uh, linguistic lines. 
So uh, people are now using social media or YouTube uh, and other satellite uh, transmissions to broadcast really, really kind of divisive messages, hit uh, messages. So uh, it is very difficult. Where, where should be uh, this freedom of the press should be guaranteed as well as how can we control or at least check hate speech and uh, to prevent more, uh, prevent uh, bloodshed and uh, divisions and conflict. So really because of the digital uh, age now, I think uh, I'm very concerned that uh, uh, the free press or this uh, freedom of expression might not bring about a significant uh, really uh, change in the, in the region. So I think that there should be some kind of balance uh, on the one hand, yes, we need to also uh, preserve freedom of expression. But on the other hand, I think people are using it for division. Uh, and also they are preaching for genocide, hate crimes, and uh, other uh, uh, hate. So that's really the problem in the Horn of Africa. I think uh, we have to balance and try to come up with a, a system and institutions which promote uh, uh, freedom of expression as well as with some kind of responsibility. I think uh, the other question is very interesting, uh, which is uh, the economic development, uh, which is the case particularly in Ethiopia. Uh, before the change happened 2018, uh, the most important source of legitimacy for the Ethiopian regime was that uh, what's important is economic development. Uh, so they imitated the Chinese model of developmental state. So they curtailed all democratic process and they try to bring about uh, economic development, but that doesn't work. Because in the first place, if there are, there are no democratic institutions, there will be, that will be a corrupt government. Uh, they were claiming to brought about like double digit economic growth in Ethiopia. But when you see the actual benefit to the people, it's not really very real. Most of the uh, wells created during those uh, economic development is to the elites, which are working directly or indirectly to the region, and it's not really fairly distributed. At the end of the day, if there is no really uh, a democratic system, such kind of economic development cannot be sustainable. Even I think not, <laughs> Uh, not only in a, a country which has been significantly divided according to ethnic lines, even now for China. Some observers are uh, saying that Chinese repressive uh, regime could not be maintained uh, uh, really with only the, the legitimacy of economic development because when the middle class uh, meet uh, really its needs, like economic needs, the next question will be freedom. So I think uh, unless we balance economic development with democracy cannot work, particularly in countries where there is severe political division and corruption, I think uh, economic development cannot be uh, really kind of a source of legitimacy for the regime and it can't work. And Ethiopia is now in a, in, in a very serious political crisis because the Ethiopian regime was trying to maintain political power in the name of promoting economic development. So I think uh, some of the, 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 the leaders are still now trying to maintain that kind of legitimacy in the name of economic development. Many of the African leaders, they didn't bring about the promise uh, and, and also they exacerbated the existing political problems in the country. So I don't think that works for uh, Horn of Africa as well. Uh, well, I would like to add a question as well, if you please, Professor. Uh, I'm not sure if you, if we would be able to to go a little bit further on the ethnic discussion, because maybe to Brazilians, although we do have a lot of uh, uh, indigenous groups in Brazil, and uh, most of us are, are absolutely not aware of that. I'm mean, talking as an anthropologist. <laughs> so uh, we have a very stereotyped, we as Brazilian, the general 
uh, in a general way, we have a very stereotyped perspective on, on indigenous groups and other uh, diver, diver, diversity. Uh, I think it might be a little odd to our audience, this connection among territories, languages, and, and ethnic groups with their specificities. So I'm not sure if you would be able to, to uh, uh, ad dance a little bit more this discussion in one sense. And I couldn't help to reflect all the time on Max Weber discussion on, on the nation state and on the, the, the legitimacy of the monopoly of the violence, right? So to, mm. to, to, cre to the creation of a modern state. Mm. And how does this fit awkwardly mm. in, in, in this experience? Because violence seems to be all the time present, but the monopoly is not a question at all. It, it, me it seems to be a sort of a, a space of, 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 of communication, although violence is not a sort of communication, but but uh, mm. anyway, mm. so how, how could we somehow foster intercultural education mm. or how come education might be uh, also a clue to add and to soften this, this, mm. this conflict? Mm. That would be my, my... Thank you. I think, uh, uh, yeah, very good question. And also it's also part of my research area. For instance, when you see these two individuals uh, on the right is uh, president of Sudan, who is from uh, uh, one ethnic group, yeah, the Dinka ethnic group, which is a major ethnic group in the country. The other is in nowhere, both of them. Historically, for instance, there has always been conflict between these two groups for hundreds of years, but it was just uh, tribal conflicts for grazing land or some kind of resources. But after uh, the, the country became independent, they politicized the difference to achieve their own interests. So in Africa, um, it's not really the ethnic or linguistic or cultural difference by itself is not a problem. The problem is the political elites, they have been using the ethnic differences to promote their own uh, uh, interests. That's why, for instance, uh, as, as I indicated on Ethiopia, uh, when they brought about this kind of uh, ethnic uh, political structure, uh, those uh, political leaders, they told that they can use um, divide and conquer, like the colonial powers, because when there is some kind of division, they think that they can stay in power. Not only they, uh, they have been using it for promoting their own interests, uh, even when you see the economic and political conditions of the people in these uh, regions, they are even much worse compared to the past. So I think in the African context, the problem is uh, since the independence of um, Africa from colonial power, as you indicated, the colonial powers, they instituted the nation state, the French uh, state model and the British model. On the other hand, the reality in Africa is very different. It's divided ethnic lines, traditional institutions are very powerful in Africa. So the African leaders, when they came to power, they faced with choices, should they continue to maintain institutions given to them by European colonial powers, or they should go back to their roots and revive traditional rules. So most of the um, Africa leaders, they prefer, prefer to continue with the uh, institutions given to them by colonial powers. But the, the, the colonial power, the, 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 the nation state kind of system only works when there is some kind of homogeneous people or speak same language. 
some level of economic progress, some level of literacy. But in Africa to practice the same nation state model uh, didn't work. On the other hand, uh, some of the countries in Africa, they try to experiment the opposite like Ethiopia. They just, uh, an Ethiopian constitution, it's provided that every ethnic group has the right to self-determination, including cessation. So it's, it's a very dangerous precedent. This is not also working. I think the, the most uh, probably uh, sustainable systems that work in Africa are some of the countries where they try to maintain national unity at the same time they try to accommodate culture and try to bring about really smooth cultural relations between the regions. One is like Botswana, for instance. Uh, the most stable country in Africa is Botswana. One of the reasons because uh, the reasons why they did is that in addition to the, the institutions they inherited from the British colonial power, they also empowered the traditional leaders. And now the, the, the Botswana political system, uh, traditional leaders, uh, particularly they control the second house uh, of parliament. So they, they have legislative power, they have executive power, they have also judiciary power. So they, they try to share uh, this power and also the for instance in the South, South Africa, what they did was even if the South Africa is uh, really a, a strong uh, kind of unitary system, they recognized uh, 11 uh, languages as a national language or at least uh, working languages for the country. Uh, so I think, uh, Many of the, the African countries, particularly those in the Horn of Africa, they failed to balance these two interests. Some of them, they just try to crush differences and uh, they claim to maintain national unity. That is uh, the case in Ethiopia before in 1991. The military socialist government was denying any linguistic or, or tribal differences. They try to crush it and they try to build uh, a big Ethiopian national national uh, unity that failed. Uh, on the other hand, uh, really trying to really polarizing the people, uh, dividing the people according to ethnic lines without promoting national unity doesn't work. So I think it's it's a very difficult, not only for, for Africa, I think even many societies around the world, it has become very difficult to find how uh, this, this, this balance could be uh, formulated. Uh, if you uh, read about this, uh, I don't know, sir, so anthropologist or uh, sociologist, uh, Will Kimilika, who is uh, from Canada, is a very, uh, really a prominent scholar. Uh, he was uh, writing about, in the last many years, he has been uh, writing about accommodating minorities uh, around the world. So he, uh, he said that, there are conditions, particularly he's promoting a commodity minority rights in the Western countries, because he says there is economic development, there is no poverty, at least major, uh, it's not a major problem. He said that there is also uh, a democracy, there is also human rights. So I think he said that the, those countries who, which have achieved some level of economic progress, established democratic system, and also protection of human rights, he said, they should able to accommodate minority rights. But uh, when he was asked to comment on, for instance, kind of politicalism that we have in Ethiopia where there is uh, ethnic division in the name of protecting minority rights, he, he says it will be very dangerous. So I think uh, it will be very, very difficult for many African countries to really find out how they would address their differences as well as maintaining their national uh, uh, unity. In addition to that, as, as I mentioned, this uh, the media, the social media, the digital media, really, it's really exacerbating the, the differences we had. Of course, uh, there has always been difference, but now in the this digital age, it has, it has become extremely difficult to really control uh, hate crime, hate, hate uh, speech which would, uh, like, as you know, Rwanda, for instance, the genocide is mainly through the media. 
So my concern is that in those countries where such uh, political uh, ethnic divisions are apparent, I think uh, such kind of uh, genocide crimes against humanity could be committed uh, because many hate groups are using the media to divide the people. So it is very challenging. The national state is not working. Even the multicultural state is not really working in the region. So I think some kind of um, balance between the two interests should be there. Otherwise, if Ethiopia is disintegrated, for instance, we have 80 ethnic groups in Ethiopia. So you can't have a state for each, 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 each state. So it's very, very difficult. Uh, on the one hand, also maintaining national unity has become very difficult because of uh, really the, the, the diverse interests in, in, the, in the country. So it's, it will be a very difficult uh, really uh, area. Well, uh, we are almost out of time. I'm not sure if Vivian or Sandra has something to add, but I'd like to, to, to thank you all for being here uh, and also for this magnificent lecture by, by Professor Abebe. Uh, I think we are speechless, uh, although we try to speak, uh, but we are still uh, looking forward for for, and, and to, to maintain the, the hope to the future and, and to achieve a, a little bit of justice, democracy, freedom of speech and peace. Uh, let us be, let us have this, this wisdom to, 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 to go that path, right? Through that path. Well, thank you all. Uh, Sandro and Vivian, I'm not sure if you would like to, to add something, but uh, thank you very much for being here. Thank you really for your interest, uh, your time, and for organizing this event and for inviting me. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity of discussing this very, very important subject. And thank you for your lecture once again, Professor Samahai. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much once again. It was very, very interesting. And I'd like just to say that it was a very, very nice opportunity to learn about these issues in Horn of Africa. So I'm really, really happy to, to have this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a great time. See you. Great, great. Well, for the ones that didn't register to uh, acquire a certificate of presence, please click on the link at the chat. And let us hope that we can find Professor Abebe once again in the future. Maybe yes. not in the squares, but maybe in the in the specific campus. That would be a, a great delight for us. Yeah, in the future also, you can invite me uh, whenever you are interested to, yeah. to know more about Africa. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Good, good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.